I'm Jacob Courtright, and this is The Locker Room. Hello, everybody, and welcome into The Locker Room on this beautiful Tuesday morning. Well, Tuesday morning for me, it will be Tuesday afternoon by the time you're listening. Uh, So welcome in on this beautiful Tuesday. Before we get started, as always, follow The Locker Room on Twitter, TLR with Jacob. On Facebook, The Locker Room host Jacob. And on Instagram, The Locker Room Podcast 615. And before we go, The Locker Room has created its official TikTok page. So if you're a TikToker, I don't know if that's the correct saying, uh, follow The Locker Room at the locker room 22 on tiktok i'm sorry i will not be doing any dances you will just have to be there for my sports commentary uh but thanks again for joining us and let's get started Well, where else do you start on this Tuesday than with what happened over the weekend? The trilogy fight between Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic completely came to an end. We got to see Stipe Miocic not only defend the title, but walk away as the greatest heavyweight of all time. Hats off to Daniel Cormier. What you have done over your career is incredible. Your performance was incredible. Uh, You had a tough break. Uh, Stipe just held you up against the fence too much, tired you out, landed too many shots. He fought a very technical fight. He was aiming for points. I don't think he was aiming for the knockout. He smelled blood in the third round, but didn't go for it. Uh, He was very technical. I thought the judges, judges' decision, besides the poked eye that they missed, they should have given DC at least five minutes to recover from that eye, Uh, but they didn't give him that. They should have given him some time for that. Other than that, I thought it was a very well-called fight. Stipe Miocic, I had him winning in my books. And at the end of the day, he walks away as the greatest to ever do it. I hope Daniel Cormier comes back. I hope he comes back for one more fight. Walk off on top like the Kobe Bryants of the world. Win your last fight. Walk off into the sunset. I don't want to remember you by losing to Stipe Miocic to finish your career. Please come back. I know you've got a nasty eye injury that's going to have to be a long time recovering. But probably by December, I think we can get you in. Fight one more time this year. You're already in that, you know, you don't want to wait a couple of years because then you're definitely out. But let's try and see you fight one more time. I want to see you walk away with your head held high. You're a top 15 fighter of all time. Um, yeah, I don't want to see you walk away this way. Stipe fought an incredible fight. Hats off to you, Stipe. I want to see your next fight against Francis or hopefully John Jones moves his way up to heavyweight and that would be a bout for the ages. John Jones versus Stipe Miocic. John Jones is the baddest to ever do it. Stipe Miocic is the baddest heavyweight to ever do it. So let's see it. I want to see what the next move for Stipe is. I want to see what the next move for John Jones is. I know Francis Naganu definitely deserves a shot at this title as well. He has worked his way back up. He has been demolishing people. Uh, the UFC has got a very bright future in the heavyweight. Didn't used to be this way. It used to be one guy kind of ran the division for years, but it's been exciting with DC in there, what he has done for the sport. He's not only an incredible ambassador for combat sports, but DC is an all-around great guy. He's a great commentator. I look forward to seeing him on all the UFC events commentating. Uh, please come back, DC. We don't we don't want to miss you. Uh, at least give us a, a walk-off win. I think you can come back, and you definitely won't be fighting for a title, I don't believe. But if you're up for it, come back for one more fight. Also, congratulations to Dana White and UFC. What the UFC has done during this quarantine, what the UFC has done during this pandemic has been incredible. They have still been able to entertain their fans, been able to put on a show, been able to get these fighters out there, keep these fighters working, been able to make their money. Congratulations. It has been incredible to see you all behind the scenes, to see you all work, to see what you all have done for the sport. Uh, I love it. You have made combat sports at the front of the line, finally. After so many years of people not respecting it the way they should, combat sports is now one of the highest rated sports in the country, strictly because of this pandemic. So if nothing came out of this but the UFC picking up more fans and people starting to respect what these guys do, uh, then kudos, because that's incredible. And it's something that this sport has deserved for a very long time. The UFC deserves the recognition that it is getting right now. Congratulations, Dana White. Another big takeaway 
uh, after the fight was actually a question that was posed to Dana White after the fight during his press conference, where it is speculated that Michael Chandler and his team have talked to the UFC and are very interested in coming over. I don't know if that's just uh, Michael Chandler and his team trying to have a bidding war between Bellator and the UFC. If so, that's a brilliant strategy because he is a hot commodity right now. Uh, or if he's serious. And if he is serious, Dana White, snatch him up immediately. Michael Chandler is one of the biggest free agents in MMA history. Michael Chandler would instantly come over and be fighting a top 10 guy. He would instantly come over and he might even be Conor McGregor's return fight. He might be Tony Ferguson's return fight. Depending on what happens with Khabib and Gaethje, he might be fighting Justin Gaethje. He would instantly be fighting one of those guys, and every single one of those guys better look out. What he did in his rematch against Benson Henderson was impeccable. First round knockout, did it with stunning fashion. Michael Chandler would be a force to be reckoned with in the UFC. He would be in name draw instantly. I, I, want, I want you in the UFC, Michael Chandler. If you're ever listening to this, make sure you get that contract figured out. Make sure Dana White takes care of you. Come over. I want to see you and Connor. I want to see you and Tony. I want to see you and Gaethje. This, without a doubt for me, is the best division in the sport right now. Definitely in the UFC is the best division. It is star-studded from top to bottom. I think you would come in and shock a lot of people. All your doubters, all these people that are complaining, saying that Bellator is weaker than the UFC, I think you'd have a lot of people biting their tongues after you debut in the UFC. So get it done, Dana. Michael, good luck. Congrats on your last win. And hopefully you come over to the UFC family. All right, well, let's transition over into this because the locker room got it right once again. Uh, I'm not trying to brag here, but I am going to pat myself on the back. Everson Griffin is now a Dallas Cowboy. That was my my top destination for Everson Griffin to begin with. It was the Titans and the Dallas Cowboys. And the Cowboys landed him. A maximum one-year, $6 million contract. Everson Griffin will plug in very nicely with these Cowboys. The Cowboys are going to definitely take this division after adding Everson Griffin. Without a doubt in my mind, I don't see any way around that. The Philadelphia Eagles have too many people opting out, too many injured people. They don't have a dynamic wide receiver core. Their quarterbacks can't stay healthy. The Washington R-words are, uh, are a joke, let's be honest, especially in this division. Congrats to the Cowboys. Everson Griffin would have been a perfect fit for Nashville, but hey, congratulations on your deal, Everson Griffin. Cowboys, congratulations on not going out and trying to, to lasso in Jadavion Clowney. Jadavion Clowney's going to, wherever he goes, he's going to have to either take less money or he's not going to be playing in the NFL this year. It's just how it's going to be. But congratulations, locker room. Uh, once again, calling the Dallas Cowboys as a perfect fit for Everson Griffin. Hey, I'm keeping a tally here. Right now, I'm definitely in the negative, but there are some positives out there as well, all right? So I got to take my small victories where I get them. All right, well, like I said, as promised, we are going to get into something a little bit more on the fun side of the NFL. I'm going to give you my top five wide receivers in the NFL and why. This is a very hot topic right now, especially all over social media. The arguments between Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, who else is up there? Let's go ahead and get into my top five wide receivers. I will start at number five and work my way up to number one. Starting at number five, we have Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is simply put the most explosive wide receiver in the NFL, the most explosive off the line, the most explosive in the field. He's a very durable wide receiver playing 43 of 48 possible games in his career. He averages over 16.5 yards a catch, which is tied for third most in the league. And he has the most touchdowns of 50 yards or more with 10. To give that any perspective, the next closest players are all tied for second place. Stephon Diggs, Amari Cooper, and Deshaun Jackson are all tied with five. So he beats them by five in that category, which is quite incredible. Tyreek Hill was a phenomenon, not only in the Super Bowl, but a phenomenon throughout the playoff run. He made players like Richard Sherman fall to the ground and break his ankles. One of the best corners we have seen uh, in the history of the league was made to look like a fool when he had to go up against Tyreek Hill. His catching ability, 
His his running ability in general when he gets into open space is second to none. Tyreek Hill, five. Number four for me, and this is going to be a very interesting one because this is this is up for debate. For me, Devontae Adams for the Green Bay Packers is the fourth best wide receiver in the league. What he has been able to do over the time at Green Bay. He has played 57 out of 64 games, so he has durability on his side. 2019, yes, he was impaired with an injury. He, that is the first season he has not had double-digit touchdowns. Uh, since then, he has had a double-digit touchdown of 10 or more in four out of five seasons. It slept on, but in 2018, he had one of the greatest wide receiver years that we have seen in a very long time, with 111 catches for 1,386 yards and 13 touchdowns. That is top five material if I've ever seen it. He has very DeAndre Hopkins-like capability in the sense that he can go up and get a ball that is heavily contested. He has good explosion off the line. He has the jumping ability of a DeAndre Hopkins. He has very solid hands, not a whole lot of drops in his career. Um, Overall, solid wide receiver, top five, definitely in the league in my opinion, four on this list. Number three, DeAndre Hopkins, the guy who did it first, the guy Devontae Adams would love to be. DeAndre Hopkins is simply put one of the greatest contested catchers that we have seen in this league. Listen to some of his numbers before. This is before Deshaun Watson got down to Texas. With Brock Osweiler, Brian Hoyer, Tom Savage, Ryan Mallett, Case Keenum, Matt Schaub, Brandon Whedon, Do you realize that's the amount of quarterbacks that this man has had in his career before he got Magic Watson? He was averaging 88 catches, over 1,200 yards, and 7 touchdowns in those seasons. Not even 100 catches to to go over 1,000 yards. 88 catches for over 1,200 yards and 7 touchdowns was his average with all of those quarterbacks. He had a catching rate of over 60% and a contested rate of over 77%. That means almost every single ball that he was having to catch was a contested ball because he had horrible damn quarterbacks throwing him the ball. I mean, I, I, besides Brock Osweiler, because I used to call him Brock Asweiler and Brian Hoyer, uh, who's Tom Savage? Sounds like a singer. Brandon Whedon is definitely a PE teacher somewhere. And Matt Schaub is... That's a hockey player if I've ever heard a name. This man was doing all that with those people throwing him the ball. Now, let's see what happens when Deshaun Watson got there. In Watson's three seasons with DeAndre Hopkins, he made a giant leap with 110 catches... 1,400 yards, and over 11 touchdowns a year. With almost a 70% catch ratio. Meaning that over 70% of the balls thrown to him, this man was catching. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. He is an incredible wide receiver, and the fact that people are sleeping on him going to Arizona with Kyler Murray is a joke. DeAndre Hopkins, 3 can't go any 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 further down. The only place he can go is up. I think him and Kyler Murray are going to be a scary pair down in Arizona. Number two, and this is a very, very close one for me, Julio Jones. What Julio Jones has done in his yards per route run is insane. This is how he is ranked in his seven seasons in the NFL. First season, he ranked fourth. Then he went first, 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 and then fifth. Oh, and let's not forget Matt Ryan was injured in this last season off and on. Even though he had a much better year towards the end, uh, and Julio Jones had a much better year towards the end because Julio was injured off and on as well. So take injuries out of the equation. He has ranked first in yards per route run. What that means is that for every route that he's running, he's gaining the most yards. He averages 2.80 yards per route run. 
That's mind-blowing to say the least. He has over a 65.7% catch ratio as well, which doesn't hurt too bad when you're catching almost 70% of every ball that comes near you. The biggest knock that a lot of people... 